Hello world, this is Craig. I'm into vintage computing, and by vintage computing this is a typical board that I'm talking about. This is a single board computer. In fact, this is the original single board computer. Intel developed the single board computer concept in about 1976. And this board has a date code on the back. It was made, it says 25-76, so it was made the 25th week of 1976. So the board is called ISBC 8010. So it's based on the 8080 processor. And the bus structure is called multibus. So multibus is a bus structure that Intel developed. And it was a contemporary of the S100. S100 was made by MITS. It was originally called the Altair bus. Had a 100 pin connector. And it was also designed for the 8080 processor. They took different paths. The S100 took the amateur path and then light commercial use for office word processing and so forth. But the multibus was designed for the hardcore commercial path, industrial process control. And so it has some capabilities that S100 doesn't have. It's built for the 8086, 8088 family. It's designed to have multiple processors, to have masters and slaves. And over time, it evolved into having multiple buses on the same card, and I'll talk about that in an, a little bit. But right now, let's look at this ISBC 8010. So this is the multibus connector down here. This is a 86 pin or 86 finger uh, connector. There's six on each end that are for power. So we've got a common pin, and then we have two five volt uh, fingers, and then we'll have either a then we'll have either a plus 12 and a minus 5, or we'll have a minus 12 and a minus 10. So, and then we'll have another common. So the first six fingers on side A and side B are for power, and then all the ones in the center are for address, data, handshaking, bus clock, and so forth. So this is the original multibus interface. The top side, so this goes into the card edge, this is the bottom, the back plane, this is the top side, and these are all of our I.O. So the I.O. connectors were rigidly defined in terms of their exact location, how many fingers they could have, and so forth. On this particular board, we have two 50s and a 26 pin. This is our serial port for a teletype or a, a terminal, and these are I.O. ports. So we have 48 pins of I.O. Our I.O. comes off of these two 8255s. So this is all of our I.O. This is our serial port. Our serial port comes off of the 8251 USART. So this is a universal synchronous, asynchronous receiver transmitter. We have four sockets for ROM. So we could have up to 4K of ROM on this board. And we have 1K of RAM built onto the board. So these boards are really nice. You can connect the connector with the power supply. You don't have to use any of the bus. You can ignore the bus for now. Connect your power supplies and fire this board right up. Connect a, uh, use a uh, little dongle to make a serial port and uh, a terminal program or connect it up to a terminal uh, so you can communicate with the board and then you have your 48 pins of I.O. that you can use. So a lot of fun packed into one board that are readily available. Uh, no, now, the 8010 is not quite so easy to come by, but one of the boards I'll show you a little later is uh, very easy to, to find for anywhere from, uh, well, the industrial supply guys will sell a board for $1,000, where a hobbyist will sell a board for a couple hundred dollars. And you can find some of these boards, if you're kind of iffy on the quality or if they work or not, down in the, the $50 range. A lot of times I'll hold out and I'll wind up buying a board for 15 or 25 bucks. Uh, but this is an 8010 with the white chips, and so it's going to wind up costing you a little bit more. I don't remember how much I paid for this board, actually. As time went on, Intel evolved the multibus standard. So this is the early standard, the first single board computer, and this was all there was really to the multibus interface. P2 was used for diagnostics, has just general I.O. that comes out of this, some of the internal clocks, uh, interrupts, resets. And so P2 was a nice uh, board to connect to when you were doing programming and diagnostics on this so that you had uh, just a connector that you could connect to a, a logic analyzer. 
Okay, so this is the 8010, the ISBC 8010 uh, from Intel. This evolved, the multibus standard evolved a bit, and there was the 8010A, uh, an 8080 version, 8086 version, the 8010B, and this is an 8010B, and this is my favorite uh, card to play with. It still has an 8080 on it. 8080, 8085s are my favorite processors. But there's a lot of improvements in this particular board. Uh, we've gone from having uh, 4K of ROM to 16K of ROM. And even better for us nowadays, this uses the 2732, so we can buy a 2732A EEPROM to put in here for a couple of bucks. So we can have a whole pocket full of 2732s when we're doing programming for this board. We also can have 4K of RAM. So we're, while the board originally came from the factory with 1K of RAM, you can expand that up to 4K. In terms of the I.O., we still are the same. We have our 48 pins of I.O. using the two 8255s. We have our 8251 USART and our serial port. It has drivers here for a teletype, or you can put in uh, uh, 1488, 1489 for an RS-232 on that. It has hardware handshaking. Uh, and then we have our full bus down here. We have our P2, which is still primarily diagnostics. But they added a new connector. This is called the ISBX, so the Intel single board computer bus expansion. And this bus is directly connected to just the lines that are connecting the 8085 and all of the other cards, all, all of the other chips on this card. So there's no drivers, there's no buffers, there's really nothing between this expansion bus and the processor. On this card, at this time it was called multi-module, but later this came to be called the ISBX, and it was standardized as such. So when you needed additional expansion or some other additional feature, there was a whole family of these ISBX cards. This is the 350, which has a parallel port on it. So this has another 8255. And as you can see, it simply just plugs in. It has a couple of standoffs. It plugs in. It gives you the exact same connector that we have on the base board parallel port. So you can get these in parallel ports, serial ports, uh, all sorts of uh, additional uh, I.O. capability. This board has one ISBX, but you would see on various versions that there might be, you know, four ISBX connectors uh, built onto this, but they were all had the same or a standardized placement and, of course, a standardized pinout and everything. So this is the ISBX. It was really the first or the next logical change to the multibus standard. So in addition to the ISBX, Intel also wanted a local bus that would allow multiple cards to communicate with each other or share signals without going on to the main system bus. This, so this P2 connector became the ILBX, or the local bus extension. So if you have a pair of cards that are working together and they have a signal that you wanted to have just directly go between one card and the next card, in the back plane you would install one of these little jumper cards that simply buses all of the connections from one finger onto the fingers of the next card. So you would plug these in and now the two cards could have all of these shared signals back and forth without having to go onto the main bus. So we have our multibus and then our ISBX and then our ILBX extension. Finally they added one more extension and it is the multi-channel. It's on the I.O. side of the card. It's a 60 pin uh, connect uh, for a ribbon cable or a twisted pair flat cable and that's the multi-channel. This is a very very high speed for uh, instrumentation I.O. control of a you know a mill or something, uh, graphics cards, whatever you might have that required very very high processing uh, throughput. This has become one of my favorite cards uh, for the single board computing. I'll for a lot of the, the playing around I do, I'll just use this card by itself. Uh, we have plenty of ROM, we have plenty of I.O., and we have plenty of uh, RAM. One of the nice things about the multibus and the single board computer concept is you really don't need to worry about the buses uh, for right now. If you want, you can run out, you can buy a board, pay what you want for it depending on how, uh, how convinced you are the seller has a working board, knows what they're talking about, and bring it home, 
connect your 5 volts, your plus or minus 12 if you want your serial, your minus 5 if it's needed, and uh, uh, fire the board right up. Start, start programming and popping in EEPROMs right away. Okay, in a later video, I'll start talking about some of these boards in detail, that if you were to go out and you find a board, you'll see that a lot of them have empty sockets. Some of the empty sockets are not critical at all, like a lot of these boards you'll find have no ROM at all. Some of the sockets are just for jumpers, like these. These sockets are for either jumpers or drivers, and so oftentimes you'll find them completely vacant. The memory will often be gone, but there's some key chips on this board that are either in sockets or on the board that the board just simply won't function without, and they're very hard to come by. So later in another video, I'll talk about uh, some of these boards, particularly my favorites, if you want to go out and hunt one down so that you can play with it, uh, you know, just some, some ideas of things that you might want to be aware of. So while we're on the subject between S100 and Multibus, let's look at a little comparison. So for example, here's my 16K ROM Multibus card, and somewhere here I have my 2K, here's my 2K ROM from my Altair. So you can see the Multibus card is, you know, it's appreciably bigger. Uh, but for the same vintage, you know, this was a card that was affordable by, uh, you know, a hobbyist, and this was a card that, you know, it may have been 10 times more. It was designed more for industrial applications where they could just simply pay for more. Typically, the Multibus will have more capabilities in terms of ROM or RAM, I.O., than a comparable a comparably dated uh, S100 card. So here's a couple of ROM boards. I've also got a multibus uh, RAM. Here's a, uh, this is a 32K RAM board. I don't have the equivalent of that in a uh, S100 sitting here. Here's a floppy disk controller card. And here's the S100 version of a floppy disk controller. This is a CompuPro uh, floppy disk controller card. OK, so in a later video, I'll talk about the shopping for, a, uh, shopping for an ISBC. And then if there's enough interest later, later we'll actually dig in and start looking at programming the USART, programming the I.O., uh, writing some monitors for it, and exactly what you can do with this to, to have a fun afternoon. Okay, thanks for watching. Talk with you later.